From the New Testament, we have John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, who's also known as Didymus, or you might know him as the twin, was one of the twelve. He was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you will have life in his name. May God bless the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. You may be seated. So good morning. It is uh, one of those wonderful Sundays, uh, the Sunday of Ask a Pastor. Uh, and so there's a couple of things I wanted to let you know, uh, because we do this, we try to do this at least once a year uh, and share all these questions. So I have asked all of you to share questions, uh, to share those questions with, uh, with me so that we can then ask them throughout the service uh, this morning. Uh, and so what we're going to do that, I'm going to invite Kimberly to come up. She has a, a list of questions that she's going to ask. I'm also going to say that if you did not get a chance to ask a question or if something comes up, you can certainly text it to me. I don't know that we're going to get to it this morning, but we'll see what happens. Uh, so if you got another question, go ahead and send it in. We'll, uh, we'll see if we can get to it. Uh, but this is kind of one of those that, uh, that as, uh, as we prepare for this, she just has, a, has free reign of, of whatever questions were submitted. Uh, so that's all I did was give her the list and let her go. Uh, well, except for there were a couple because there's a couple that I'm going to do. I'm going to do one next week and one the following week. So there were a couple of questions that, that were a little more in-depth uh, that I didn't feel I could answer within like a one to two minute answer. Uh, and so I'm going to push those off and, uh, and give you a more in-depth answer for some of those. So if those were your questions, you're just going to have to make sure you come back next week and the week after so that you can hear the answers to those. Uh, so yeah, so uh, Kimberly Lynch is with us here this morning. So just in case some of you might not know who she is, uh, this is Kimberly and she has, she has free reign. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to start and heavy, so think, think, think. When you were young, what kind of dinner or cake did you ask for on your birthday? Uh, see, okay, so we do this, this tradition in, in the family that when it's your birthday, you get to choose the restaurant uh, that you can go to. Uh, we never really did that when I was growing up, uh, and so I, I think about that. For dinner, I don't really remember much about dinner, but I remembered a cake that I love to have uh, and think I only had it once. And so, Mom, if you're watching, uh, make sure you correct me on this. But it was the train cake. The train cake, and I'm not sure if anybody else had those, but it was like multiple cakes. There were about six cakes, uh, and they were all connected like a train. 
Uh, and so I remember seeing that and always wanting to have the train cake. So, yeah, mom responds. Sherry's probably watching and watching <laughs> the online comments, so you'll see if mom responds. All right. Were they otherwise, for otherwise, we'll just say breakfast, and we'll say breakfast was always putting on toast, if we could have putting on toast. Some of you had that over uh, the, other, uh, the other week, I think Palm Sunday, when we had breakfast here. So That was a hidden wonder. <laughs> okay, so how do people end up in leadership positions? What's the process, and are there terms, or is it open-ended? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. Uh, so the Book of Discipline is what the United Methodist Church uh, follows. Uh, although many churches don't necessarily follow it completely when it comes to the church leadership. Part of that hap- happens to, to fall in around the number of members within churches and the ability to do this. Uh, leadership within the church, usually it starts with a committee called the Nominations Committee. Uh, and I chair the Nominations Committee with uh, a couple of other people. Uh, and so what we do is we go through the church membership, and some, some of you remember filling out those time and talent sheets Uh, this is partly where some of those time and talent sheets come in because we can take a look and see if anybody's interested in in filling any other positions. Uh, But the nominations will then uh, reach out to people and say, hey, how would you feel about serving on trustees, on finance, on mission, on uh, any number of other committees? Uh, And then once they accept, then it goes to church council. Church council then votes and approves it during our annual church conference, which usually is in the fall of every year. Uh, And so we set a slate of leaders that are on all of those worship teams. And there's a number of worship teams. Uh, In fact, if you're looking for a list of those teams, let me know and I can email that out to you. Uh, But that is where, uh, that's kind of the process of getting into leadership. Some of the committees have uh, other rules that go along with it, so like the trustees. Uh, The trustees themselves have to vote for their chair, their secretary. They have to vote for their officers. Uh, The other committees don't necessarily have to do that. Uh, But the other part of that question was, uh, are there there term limits? Uh, Now it begins like we're talking about the... uh, the political scene and whether or not we should have term limits or not, and that's a whole other conversation. Uh, but within the United Methodist Church, according to the Book of Discipline, they, they push for three-year term limits. Now, a lot of times this is difficult because of uh, membership and because of the engagement that we have with membership. And many of you have been uh, within churches, maybe this one, uh, a previous church that you were with, uh, that it was the same leaders on the same committees all the time. And part of that is because no one else is willing to kind of step up and, and step into those roles. I. Uh, so one of the things is, is we're, we're working actually towards that. Some of the leadership that, uh, that you'll see on our leadership report shows those term limits. So it shows a three-year process. Uh, now, granted, when we reach the end of the three years, if we don't have anybody that kind of steps up in there, then it kind of gets re-upped, uh, and then the, uh, the term changes again. Uh, but, uh, but that's kind of the way we're trying to go. The other thing that we, that we could possibly look at, which depending on how things go, we're going to look at the, the CAT survey next week, uh, is possibly changing up a little bit of the governance uh, of whether or not we, we have all these different mission teams or if there's a more streamlined way to do it. And that's one of the conversations that, uh, that we as Journey of Hope will have. Uh, but yes, I, I hope that helps. If there's a follow-up, text me. <laughs> so if there's someone interested in a leadership process or a leadership position yeah. or something, what would you suggest they do? I would suggest that they give me a call. Send me an email. Send me a text. Let me know if you're interested. Like I said, if I'm, uh, since I'm the chair of nominations, uh, then when we start meeting throughout the summer into fall, uh, we can start pulling people's names together and, and lining those up. Great. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we're going to pull from the theological side right. a little bit. Why do you think God has not gotten rid of the devil? Oh, <laughs> wow. All right, <laughs> go from light, that's, that one's pretty deep. Uh, <laughs> so what I would say with that is that uh, 
First of all, we have to, we have to agree that, that God has the ability to get rid of the devil. Uh, and I think, if, if I'm not mistaken, I think we all in, in this room can agree that God has the power to get rid of the devil. Uh, and so if we can all agree on that, then let's go back to, okay, so why has God not gotten rid of the devil? Why is the devil still prevalent in our, in our lives today? Uh, and, and part of the way I kind of look at this is, uh, is Jesus as he is, as he is crucified, uh, or as it is leading up to that, there's, there's passages that talk about Jesus being glorified. Uh, and when we hear Jesus being glorified, a lot of that is Jesus being lifted up and glorified. And to us, that would mean Jesus is being glorified on the cross. Uh, and so, there is a lot of power in that statement. First of all, there's a lot of power in what Jesus did for us on the cross. Uh, but being glorified on the cross through the, through the actions of, you really could say, of, of the devil... Uh, because of the people that were crucifying him that day, that the glorification was even more prevalent. And so, in our lives, as we come to our faith, as we start to understand who God is and, and who we are as Christians, are we not glorifying God even more when we resist the temptation of the devil? When we run from all of those really bad things that, uh, that the devil is out there working in in our lives? Are we not glorifying God even more through that process? Uh, and that's kind of where I would see this, that, that yes, God has the power to get rid of the devil, but there is, you know, I think many of us are, are along this same path also of, of saying that we have this some type of human liberty we have what a lot of people would call free will. We can choose. Uh, we can choose the evil. We know a lot of people that do choose the evil. Uh, but we can also choose the good. Uh, and so there is, there is that problem of, of knowing that that is still out there, but, but knowing that we can resist that, then we build on our faith even more. Uh, and I think one of these things that, we'll, uh, that I actually want to talk about in two weeks, uh, because one of the questions that came in was talking about deconstruction uh, and deconstruction of faith. And I'm not sure if anybody has heard of that comment or that, that phrase, uh, but I want to share a little more about that in, in the third week of this Asa Pastor. Uh, but that really kind of goes along with the, uh, the question about, you know, whether or not, you know, why is the devil still around? Uh, and I think it's because we can then glorify God even more by turning from, from Satan uh, and moving on to a stronger faith and a more glorifying faith of who God is. Thank you. Okay. So back to another deep one. A deep one. How do you find your sermon series? Do you find them online, the videos? Oh. How does that all come to play? Or do you just be like, ah, we're just going to take it off the cuff and run? <laughs> That's a good question. You know, the, I, yeah, there's, there are some that have been kind of just, it, it just comes to me, uh, you know, for some of them. Some of the other ones uh, actually come from you. Uh, because I do remember there was a, uh, there was a Stone Catcher series uh, that, uh, that came from... Carol, uh, I think it was Carol Hecht, uh, that stone catchers came from, or, or maybe that was, that might have been Betty, uh, but I, I received a little article about that, and I went, that's, that's really good, that's, that's kind of key. The Wizard of Oz series, that came from Dan Hahn. It was a Wednesday morning Bible study that we were talking about, and he mentioned the Wizard of Oz, and I went, oh, that could work as a sermon series. Uh, and so it's, Part of this is kind of like the 531 moments. If you're open enough uh, to, to continually hear what God is speaking, things just pop out of nowhere. Uh, there are some, like Easter ones, uh, Advent ones, uh, like our most recent Advent one was a book from Matt Rawl about the, uh, the story of the Grinch. Uh, we also did the story of Scrooge. That was also from the author Matt Rawl. And you've all done a number of, of worship series uh, from Adam Hamilton, where we've done through Easter, through whether it was Seven Words with Susan Robb, but also The Way, 
uh, 24 Hours That Changed the World. Uh, some of those come from, from other authors and other books. Uh, but some of them are just, you know, looking out across the congregation and saying, who are we? And what does God need to speak with us about? So, yeah. And uh, I'm not sure, Paul, if you're getting this, but I'm, there is something burning. <laughs> it, we, it has been turned off? Okay. I just wasn't sure if it was... Back, at, back in Lanark, the, uh, the, the front of the sanctuary was just above the kitchen. Uh, and so on the good days when they were doing potlucks, the food smell would come right up where I was preaching. I think it was designed that way so that I would preach much faster when it was like a potluck Sunday. <laughs> but uh, I wasn't sure if you were getting that smell from back here. So <laughs> I was smelling that too, but I thought yes. it was the candles. But uh, Okay. So what do you feel is Journey of Hope's number one strength, and then on the contrary, the number one area needing improvement? Mm. You know, th this is actually going to be revealed even more, I think, in, uh, during our, our CAT assessment results. Mm -hmm. uh, I've already I've glanced at them. I've actually talked with my clergy coach, who is our consultant, uh, and have already kind of gone through some of those. But I would say, even before we got the results back in, uh, Journey of Hope's greatest strength uh, came when we merged Wesley and Epworth together. We brought two congregations together to form Journey of Hope with a new identity, a new mission, a new vision, and new energy to move forward. Uh, I mean, we are in kind of this transformational position right now uh, of moving forward. And, and I don't know if many of you have witnessed this. I mean, I certainly witnessed this last Sunday uh, as we got close to maybe needing to add a few more chairs in the sanctuary. Uh, but the energy uh, and the passion that, that I'm getting from a lot of you, uh, I would say is probably the number one strength. Uh, and we need to capitalize on that. We really do. Uh, the number one area of growth is kind of in the same vein. We merge two churches together to form one journey of hope. Uh, and the hard part within a merger is usually it's in about the year two, year three, uh, that things start to revert back. Uh, and to revert back, what I mean is by going back to uh, past traditions, past things that, that used to work, instead of moving forward, uh, it's kind of taken that step back and almost going, away. I'm a little uncomfortable. Can I go back to where I was comfortable? Uh, things are going really well. Uh, I mean, I remember Dave, uh, Dave Kellenberger at one of our meetings was like, he says, I love being treasurer when things are good like this. Uh, it's not so fun when, when things are really difficult. Uh, and so the, the number one area for improvement, I, I think, really is uniting behind journey of hope. Uniting behind that mission and that vision. I mean, we're, we're two years old. You're going to read about it in, in the newsletter as you, as you got it, or you probably already read it this morning, uh, is that we're two years old. We're getting ready to celebrate that two-year anniversary at the end of May. I uh, is to think of us as Journey of Hope and not think of us as, as Epworth and Wesley. But we are one together. Uh, the other piece is, is not taking that step backwards into comfort. Uh, and so I, I want to tell you this, but I don't want to tell you this <laughs> uh, because this is difficult. Uh, because you can choose who you are as a congregation. You can choose to be comfortable. You can really do that. You can choose to be comfortable and to be where you have been for, for years and years. Or you can be growing in your faith. You can be growing in your knowledge of God. You can be growing uh, and expanding, and you can be vital. That is your choice. And so, 
regardless of what you choose. So, okay, so you can, you can choose to be comfortable, you can choose to be growing and active and, and passionate and, and growing in your faith and becoming vital. If you choose to be comfortable, I don't know if I'm the one for you. And I know that that's, that's really hard to say. It's really hard for me to say. But this is where we are. And so that's a really deep question. Uh, but I hope that, that you understand this, that, that we are at that point of two years into the merger. And so we can now choose. And the CAT survey is going to help us do this as we talk about it next week. And so just put that in, put that in your bonnet and, and, and sit with it for a minute. But, but yes, you can be comfortable, you can be vital. But if you want to be comfortable, I just don't know that, that I'm the right person. Uh, and so that's our strength. That's where we need to grow. Okay. We're going to lighten it up. Sorry. Nope. <laughs> it's all good. When pastors get together, what do they talk about? <laughs> all of you. <laughs> <laughs> no, not just kidding. I mean, yes, there is, there is some of that, but you obviously know that, you know, that when pastors get together, it's like, yeah, we talk about congregations, we talk about ministries, it's not all the, the bad things, it's, you know, there's a lot of really cool things, and, uh, and I've gone through a number of my years with, with clergy friends that they don't ask me anymore. They don't like talking to me about, you know, how's church life? How, how's the congregation doing? They go, ah, don't ask Jared, because Jared says the same thing all the time. Hey, everything's great, everything's wonderful. People love me. The ministry's going good, you know. And so, like, so they ask everybody else, "Hey, how are your churches?" <laughs> Since you don't want me to talk, uh, but yeah, we do. We do talk about uh, ministry. We also talk uh, really about, truly about ministry. About how is it with your soul? How are you doing? Uh, because there's a lot of times. I mean, I've been blessed with uh, a couple of congregations. Uh, technically, I could say three uh, here, and then one down in Lanark, that, uh, that, really, that really reach out and will ask me from time to time, really truly meaning it, saying, how are you doing? You doing okay? How's the family? Uh, you know, and, and so uh, we try to do that for ourselves too. We try to reach out to each other and say, are you doing okay? Can we support you in any way? Uh, and so, yeah, so yes, all of you, but then also all of you in the good way, so. Have you ever been present at a laying on hands for healing? Uh, laying out of hands for healing. Laying out of hands, absolutely. Absolutely. Healing, uh, as far as like, uh, we've, we've, I have been present for a number of laying on hands for, for spiritual and emotional healing. Uh, have, have been present, actually, I, I got to say this, yeah, for some physical healing. Uh, we do a lot of laying out of hands uh, through uh, this spiritual retreat called Walk to Emmaus. Uh, and we, we lay on of hands for uh, those that are serving on that particular retreat uh, that God would continue to use them. Uh, I've done laying out of hands uh, in youth groups. Uh, youth groups, we would do a silent uh, a silent worship night. And at the end of the silent worship night, we would gather all the youth together and bring one at a time up. Uh, and all the leaders would, would lay hands on that youth and pray for, uh, pray for not only their spiritual guidance, uh, but also for anything that's going on in their lives. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is powerful, people. Uh, and I've said that multiple times, that it's like, you know what, hey, if we truly believe that God is going to provide everything that we need, then prayer is not optional. Prayer is not optional. We have to do this. Uh, I've done anointing of oil. In fact, I, most recently, I... I know Jenny is out there somewhere. Uh, I, at least I thought I saw her. Oh, there she is. She's, She's behind Ron. <laughs> uh, and just, you know, in some difficult times of just anointing with oil and, and prayers uh, for healing, prayers for strength and for guidance. Uh, and I have seen God work. I have seen God manifest, uh, manifest in those situations. Uh, so prayer is a powerful thing. How does the United Methodist Church deal with questions around mandatory reporting and clergy mm. um, penitent, penitent yeah. personal privilege? There was a, 
it, and, I, and I saw that one. So there was a, the question was brought up because there was a, a story out of Crystal Lake. Uh, and so I, I'm not going to go too much into this because I don't know the, the structure uh, and the governance of the, uh, the Jehovah's Witness Church. Uh, but this is where this problem came in, uh, that a, somebody came to the elders of the church uh, and opened up to them under confession that, that they had abused uh, a child. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, from, from what I've understood, uh, was that the two elders that were approached with that said that that was kind of the clergy penitent relationship, and they couldn't share that. Uh, like I said, I don't know much about uh, the, the polity and the governance there in, in that church. I do know, however, my position within the United Methodist Church. I am a mandatory reporter. So if anything like that were to come up to me, even in a side conversation anywhere, I am required by law to make a report. Because if I don't, and Dave would probably back me on this, somebody could come after me, and somebody probably will, uh, if I knew something and didn't share it. Uh, so as a mandatory reporter, I am required to, uh, to bring those out. What do you believe happens to non-believers? Where were their souls go? Hmm. I said this once before. Uh, I am not God, <laughs> nor do I want to be. Uh, and so I do not want to be on that judgment seat. Uh, there is a lot of, of conversation around this. Uh, and, and let me... Let me be upfront with you to begin with, and that is, is that the things that I say, the things that, that I hold as beliefs, I'm not saying that you have to hold 100% to everything that I say. Because if you go around clergy, around this Northern Illinois Conference, you'll find that there are differing uh, theological understandings of different things between clergy. Uh, and so, uh, if there's something that I say that you don't fully believe, believe uh, we can certainly have a conversation. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that you're wrong. Uh, this, again, goes back to the whole I'm not God and I'm not on the judgment seat. Uh, but what I will say is this. Uh, I've mentioned this before, uh, and that we just celebrated the resurrection. We celebrated the resurrection uh, of Jesus from the cross, which then offers new life to all people. Uh, what God does with the merit of, of what Jesus did on the cross is God's business. Uh, and this came up actually in, in kind of the topic of some of the other, uh, some of the other religions in the world. Uh, and whether or not somebody asked me, well, actually it asked, was asked in my ordination questions, you know, if I was a Muslim, do I get to go to heaven? If I was a uh, Buddhist or Hindu, uh, do I get to go to heaven? Uh, and that's where I said, you know, I, if God chooses to apply the merit of what Christ did on the cross to any particular person, then that's God's business, not mine. Uh, I will say that, you know, Scripture tells us that, that, that the way, the truth, and the life is Jesus Christ. No one reaches the Father except through Christ. What does that mean? Uh, and, and so sometimes, I, in fact, I heard uh, another clergy person express it this way, uh, and that is, is that there... There are people out in our world that don't claim to be Christian that lead a much more Christian life than a lot of people that say they're Christians. Uh, and you probably know some of them. Uh, you probably know some of the people that say they're Christians that don't necessarily lead that Christian life. Uh, and so the, the, the question becomes is that, is that at that moment when, uh, when that person stands before God on that judgment day, Hey, and, and that person is there and, and looks and says, it was you all along. It was you all along. I didn't have the words to describe what that was. But I lived my life for you. I serve people for you. I did all of this uh, in this particular hope and grace. Uh, you also might remember a passage in Scripture from, I believe it's from Matthew, that, uh, that Jesus was talking, about, talking to people and saying, you know what, hey, you're going to reach that time when you come up, to, come up to me at that judgment seat, and I'll say, I never knew you. I never knew you. 
And so the question then becomes is, do we want to, do we want to know who Jesus is? Or do we want to know Jesus? Do we want Jesus to know who we are? Or do we want Jesus to know us? Uh, and so, yeah, as far as, you know, going back to the, to the non-believers, uh, certainly there are some that, that have just rejected God and are, and are living wicked lives. Uh, there's always that story of the, the death row inmate, of what happens, you know, at the, the very last moment that that person says, you know, God, I need you. And I realize that what I've done for most of my life is wrong, and I need forgiveness. And while some of us may have this issue of, of somebody at the last minute being accepted into heaven, we also think that there was the thief on the cross next to Jesus that was accepted into, uh, into paradise at that particular moment. Uh, and so no one is beyond the grace of God. I think we got time for maybe one or two more. Okay. <laughs> Just go if by so money fast. was no object, uh, where would you travel? Holy Land. I think no, no doubt at this point. I, you know, yes, the beaches are wonderful. Uh, warmer climates are beautiful, but but the Holy Land uh, would be. I, I would jump on a plane in a heartbeat and head over there. Even though there's a whole bunch of unrest going on over there, yeah. And in Jesus 8, in, excuse me, in John 8, what was Jesus writing on the ground? Mm. You know, I had a message about this uh, a while back. I don't remember what series that was in. Uh, but the, the way I kind of viewed it, I mean, there's a number of different views on, on what Jesus was actually writing. Uh, was, was, it just a, uh, was it just a gesture uh, of writing? in the dirt. There's, uh, there's some belief behind that. Uh, the one that really sticks out to me, uh, that made a lot of sense to me because of what happens immediately after, uh, is that Jesus was actually writing sins. He was drawing and writing in, in their alphabet, writing out sins. But it wasn't just any sins, and it wasn't necessarily the sin of the woman that was about to be stoned. I see him as writing those sins of the people that were gathered there that day because what happens immediately after? He starts writing in the sand and all of a sudden, everybody leaves. You know, did they leave because of what Jesus spoke before? Or did they leave because there was a combination of what Jesus said and what Jesus wrote? said, hey, you who have the, or without sin, cast the first stone. And if you think you're without sin, hang on. And then starts writing. And they go, oh, wait a minute. He knows. He knows about me. <laughs> Granted, he knows me. Uh, and I'm getting out of here. So I, that's really the part that really stuck out, sticks out to me. How about one more? One more. We cannot close without the answers to these two questions. <laughs> okay. Your favorite ice cream and your favorite coffee. Oh, favorite ice cream. Uh, just scooped mint chocolate chip. Amen. Uh, if you got to go somewhere uh, other than an Al's Creamery shake, uh, would be, and they don't have it for a while, so if any of you have an insight into, uh, into Andy's, down the street, uh, make sure that you uh, tell them to get espresso back uh, because they had a thing called the jitterbug. Loved it. The jitterbug concrete. It was vanilla ice cream with toffee chunks and espresso. Yeah. Ooh. That was really good. Favorite coffee? Uh, favorite coffee right now is the Journey of Hope Dark Blend. Oh, that's good. <laughs> And so make sure you get some when you go over there. Or the light blend is really good, too. Uh, otherwise, uh, my other favorite would probably have to be like the Starbucks Veranda blend, which is the blonde roast. That's a good coffee, too. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. There are a number of other questions that are on here. 
Uh, and so I will let you know this, that I do have all those questions. Uh, I'm going to mark off the ones that we have asked. Uh, and I'm going to try to go through some of those other questions and share them through social media, uh, maybe through our weekly e-news, uh, so that if your question didn't get answered, unless, of course, it's, it's these other two, which is one, next week we'll be talking about uh, what are your views of God's creation, which is a beautiful one. wish I could have actually shared that today because this is like, Earth Day was Friday, and this would have been a perfect day for that, but I'll do that next week. Uh, and then the week after that, we'll be looking at deconstruction. And what is that? Because that is a huge trend that maybe you're not aware of, uh, but I think you need to be. Uh, and so it'll, it'll be a really fun time to, uh, to kind of discuss that one as well. So once again, thank you so much. Uh, I hope you got a little better insight into me. Uh, as well as maybe some of those, those theological questions that you said, I've always wanted to ask this, but I've never really gotten a good answer that I've really understood. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly, for thank asking. You.